Good morning, everyone. So my name's Kim Langer, and I'll be the moderator this morning. I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest speakers about this important topic. The session is designed to be interactive, but we do ask that you hold your questions until the end. We'll have a, a certain session for Q&A. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sandeep Jain and Dr. Sunita Nathan. Dr. Jain is the director of the Dry Eye and Ocular GBHD Clinic at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he directs the Translational Biology Laboratory in the Department of Ophthalmology. He is the founding program director of the National Eye Institute, National Institutes of Health funded chronic GBHD meeting in Chicago, which focuses on the intersection between the areas of chronic GBHD and dry eye slash ocular surface disease. Dr. Nathan is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of the Division of Hematology and the Director of the Quality Program in the Oncology and Cell Therapy Section of BMT and Cellular Therapy at Rush Medical College in Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, it's loud enough. Uh, everybody can hear without the echo, right? Well. Um, and I really want to thank BMT Infonet also to organize this uh, very special meeting. And they're doing just a wonderful job in, uh, in getting uh, people to come together to, uh, to think about this condition that, uh, that develops, which uh, really affects the quality of life of, uh, of patients. Uh, it, it affects many parts of the body, and, uh, and the eye is one of them. And we're going to be talking about the eye today and how graft versus host disease affects the eye. Uh, it is, in fact, the eye problems are, in fact, one of the most common complications that happen after bone marrow transplant and perhaps uh, uh, affect the quality of life of patients after bone marrow transplant in a very significant way because uh, you need to see to be able to do anything, whether it's uh, working on your iPhones or your computers or even going outside without, uh, uh, without the uh, light sensitivity bothering you or just the pain and discomfort uh, that can come from, um, uh, f uh, come if the eyes get involved. So uh, the way I want to uh, think about this presentation is to ask a few questions and see uh, what the answers to them would be. And these are just, uh, just, just very few basic questions that we'll be looking at. And uh, I would encourage everybody to think about questions that you can ask me either after the presentation, but be free to uh, interrupt during the presentation as well. Uh, I want this to be sort of interactive. There is no point on me lecturing. I'm here to answer questions. And the best uh, information is the information that you seek, not the information that I want to tell. That may just go over you. You may ignore it. It's uh, maybe important for me, but maybe not important for you. So, um, so we'll try to keep this. So I'm going to deviate a little bit from what the program uh, uh, structure is to say that uh, ask questions if, uh, if you have one. Um, I've already been introduced. I run the, uh, I am the director of the UIC Ocular GBHD Clinic. It's a, uh, we've uh, linked our laboratory with the clinic and uh, this system has allowed us to uh, generate new ideas, new data about the disease, uh, why it happens, and new therapeutics. We'll talk about uh, some of that today. So these are the type of questions that I was talking about. What is ocular GVHD? I mean, that's uh, something very basic. Uh, do I have IGVHD? Uh, is it just another form of dry eye? Uh, how do you treat it? Uh, will I go blind from it? Do I have to use the eye drops forever? Are there any new, new treatments that can help me? These are some of the plattering of questions that, uh, that are there. Uh, just a few. And, uh, and of course, there are uh, many more that stem from these questions. So what is ocular GVHD? That's, ocular GVHD is a severe inflammation of the surface of the eye that develops after bone marrow transplant. In general, we see the highest risk to be between about seven to nine months. That's where it starts. 
till about two years. That time period is the time period when one is at greatest risk for developing ocular GVHD. It presents as a red, irritated eye. Uh, there could be mucus uh, discharge from the eye. There could be light sensitivity. Uh, it's, it's just uncomfortable. And sometimes the, the vision is also reduced. So it is a symptomatic red eye that develops. Now, the most important thing in, uh, in this slide or at this point is to understand that one should not ignore the initial symptoms as they develop. The moment the eye starts acting up, there is either redness or uh, mucus discharge or there is uh, discomfort or light sensitivity, one needs to be examined right away by an ophthalmologist and not just go to the drugstore to get artificial tears and um, write it out or use uh, uh, restasis or things like that to think that we should treat it as just another dry eye. We'll talk about that more. Why? Because there is only a small window of opportunity in which we can aggressively control inflammation as it is developing to get best outcomes. If the inflammation, uh, if we allow the inflammation to develop before going to the uh, aggressive treatments that we'll talk about, then it may already be too late. The tear production may already have gone down. The lacrimal gland which produces tears may already have uh, lost its ability to produce tears. The surface of the eye may have already had scarring complications and inflammation may have already caused a lot of damage. So you don't want that to happen. And that's what is, I think, the number one message of this uh, talk, that the moment the eye symptoms develop, you need to go to someone who has treated this condition. Ideally, one should go before transplant for a baseline exam and then uh, so that one can figure out if there is any change. So this is what ocular GVHD is a severe inflammation of the surface of the eye that can develop after bone marrow transplant, usually between uh, seven to two years after the transplant. Do I have ocular GVHD? That's the other question. Well, we as a group, um, me and uh, several other um, individuals uh, from all over the world got, uh, got together about five or six years ago to develop a classification system that, uh, that takes four, uh, three clinical signs and one symptom into consideration to, uh, to diagnose ocular GVHD in a more formal fashion. And we give numbers to everything, numbers to a patient's misery by doing uh, symptom analysis, uh, stain the surface of the cornea with dyes to see how much uh, surface disease is, dryness is, uh, see how, the red, how red the eye is, and measure the tear production. And all of this, we put some numbers on it to tally up the numbers in the end to see whether they rise above the level where we can diagnose uh, the patient as having ocular GVHD or not. So what are the things we do? We measure the tear production. Why? Because in uh, ocular GVHD, the ability to produce tears uh, becomes, uh, is lost uh, because of damage to the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland sits uh, over here, they put, it produces tears, and they are very important for the, uh, for the eye health. If you don't produce tears, the eye will be dry, the surface will become diseased, and it will be, uh, the eye will become red, irritated, and it will be very uncomfortable. So the second thing that we do is to see how much surface disease there is, what is the dry, how much dryness there is, what has the dam damage uh, to the surface cells been caused by the dryness. Now, once the eye is dry, the cells that line the surface of the eye, their membranes become damaged. Once their membranes become damaged, if we put a dye on the surface, it's a blue dye called lysamine or fluorescein, it can enter the cells. Normally it won't enter the cells. If the cells are healthy, the dye is not gonna go inside the cell. But if the membranes are damaged because of dryness, because of ocular GVHD, the dye will enter the cells. And we'll see those cells as uh, spots, whether it is a fluorescent spot with fluorescein or a green or a blue spot with lysamine green dye. And this is what this slide shows. 
this is another slide to show you uh, what these dots look like when we stain with fluorescein. You see these tiny dots. I don't have a cursor to put on the dots, but I think they are probably visible. So, uh, but these are the fluorescent dots. And uh, now this is lysamine green dye, which uh, you will see as blue dots. Can you see the blue dots over there? Okay, so these are cells that are damaged on the surface of the cornea. The transparent part of the eye, there are cells on uh, the transparent part of the eye which are damaged, and that's why the dye is going inside. And why is that important? Because the structure, this structure of the eye is very sensitive. It has some of the densest nerve supply anywhere on the body. Any problem over here, you're going to feel it. I mean, if, if there's a corneal scratch, if anybody has had a corneal scratch, you know it's very painful. So anything over here is going to cause pain, and that's what's happening here. And this is when we do both uh, uh, things dies together. Then we put a number on how, uh, what the symptoms are, uh, what the complaints are, and we ask questions like, do you have light sensitivity? Is, uh, is there eye discomfort? Uh, does the eye really act up in windy conditions and so on? And we give a number to each one of those answers, depending on whether they are some of the time or most of the time or all of the time. And then uh, and that is factored in, into our classification system. And then we uh, look at how red the eye is. And then again, we put a number on um, and, uh, and diagnose the patient as having, having either ocular GVHD or not. And that's important because we want to know where we start from. We want to know whether treatments are having an effect or not. And it's nice to have quantitative numbers rather than just saying, looks like uh, your eye is red irritated. But that you can also tell by looking in the mirror. So what are we doing? So we, we want to know where you start from. We want to know what the treatment effects are. And also, we want to compare things across different centers. And it's nice to have something that is standardized. So is GVHD another, just another dry eye? And that is the number one reason why people suffer from this disease and they don't get treated very well. Because there is a, uh, there is a thought process that prevails that, well, this is just another dry eye. Uh, the tear production is not there. What's the difference between this and somebody who has autoimmune dry eyes, Sjogren's, or just the garden variety dry eye, or you're working on the computer too much and the eyes are irritated, so that's another dry eye. It's the same symptoms, so it's a, just use artificial tears, you'll be okay. That's the mistake people make. This is not just another dry eye. This is severe inflammation of the surface of the eye due to a, a very profound immune attack that is being launched on the surface of the eye by uh, after bone marrow transplant. It is uh, it presents subacutely as opposed to chronicity that we see in dry eye. There are differences. This is one place where we see scarring uh, on the surface of the cornea. We don't see that with Sjogren's at all, or very few patients. So if we flip the upper lid, I'll show you some pictures. Uh, we can see scar line, scarring over there, which is probably pathognomic, which is characteristic of this condition. You don't see that in other conditions. And this is the problem with GVHD in any case, inflammation and scarring in other organs also. So is the case with the surface of the eye. And so th is this different than just another dry eye? The answer is you bet, it is. And it has to be treated differently also. You can't think of it as just another dry eye. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, there would be a lot of suffering. There will be the disease is going to just cause more and more problems. Uh, so what are the differences? Here, uh, there are uh, mucocellular aggregates, which means the mucus that comes out. The mucus that comes out is not just mucus. It's a collection of inflammatory cells, a lot of bioactive molecules. It is an inflammatory uh, process that we are seeing. It is not just simply mucus. So that's, again, uh, something we need to understand. This is what I was talking about, the scarring that you see under the lids. That whitish area that you see on, uh, on the top two uh, slides, which uh, that's scar. You, don't, you shouldn't have that. And this is what happens in ocular GVHD. And very highly diagnostic of uh, this condition. The lower slides show how uh, the conjunctiva, which is the covering of the eye, how it is scarred. And now if you pull it down, that tenting that you see, Normally, you don't see that. 
So why? Because the fornix, the recess, has become uh, scarred and has become shallower. So all of this is happening because of, of scarring. This is another thing that happens, which is that blue spot that you see on the white of the eye, uh, that is lysamine green staining, the same blue dye, showing that under the upper lid, if you lift the upper lid on the white of the eye, there is a big patch of dryness, which is extremely painful, causes a lot of pain. This is called a superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, or SLK type of uh, picture. Again, uh, this needs to be uh, taken care of. Uh, Mebomian glands, the, there are oil glands inside the eyelids. They uh, drop out. And sometimes there is a complete wipe out of these glands. These glands are very important because they produce oil, which keeps the tears on the surface of the eye. If they are not producing oil, the tears are not going, even if you're producing tears, they are going to evaporate. It's not going to be uh, helpful. And so we need to replace these oils. If we don't, if we are not producing it, we need to replace them. Otherwise, uh, the surface of the eye is going to be very diseased. So there are a lot of things, as you can tell from what I'm saying, that happen. And it's not just a simple dry eye. There is the eyelid. It, there is something we call keratinization, which means that the eyelid uh, starts taking the appearance of skin. And that's another problem that happens. Uh, and that whitish thing that you see going on in these uh, slides, that's, uh, uh, that's keratinization. And that's, again, can rub against the cornea, produce problems. This is a, uh, the cells on the surface of the eye here are uh, not normal. And this is something which we call, what you see in these slides is squamous metaplasia, which is also something that, we can, uh, that, that can happen with chronic inflammation that we see in these patients. Non-healing epithelial defects, the, the surface can break down and refuses to heal for a long time till we do something uh, specific and something aggressive to make it heal. So a lot, as you can tell, there's a lot going on here, right? And unless somebody is, uh, uh, somebody is experienced in these, an ophthalmologist uh, or an optometrist, uh, you, sh you need to have their help. You need to, uh, to seek treatments that are going to uh, pre a, prevent these things from happening, these complications from happening, but if they've happened, to treat them. But how do you treat them then? So let's talk about that. Um, so if you have the, if, if a patient has these problems, if there is ocular GVHT and you are uncomfortable and there are all of some of the things that I've shown you, um, they are there, we, have certain general guidelines which, uh, one, which I think are useful in planning the treatment. The first is that uh, you can't use preserved eye drops. Preserv any, any eye drop that is preserved has benzalkonium or any other preservative in it, which is really a detergent, which is going to, be which is going to mess up the surface even more. It's starting up with a surface that has so much of problem, why would you put something that causes more problem? Doesn't make sense. So, why, so we shouldn't do that. So anything that we uh, use on the surface, it should be non-preserved. Then we use a step-down approach, which means that uh, we start with a lot of uh, therapy, anti-inflammatory therapy and surface healing therapy in combination so that we control the process rapidly. What is the, there is no logic to going uh, just artificial tears, then a little bit more, and if it doesn't help, then a little bit more, then a little bit more. That's not helpful. If there is inflammation on the surface, you'll agree with me that we want to get rid of it as soon as possible. So why don't we get rid of it as soon as possible? And that's, I think, the other uh, principle that we use is that we start a lot of treatments uh, together, and then we cut down because we want this process to be under control. We want the surface to be not under the immunological attack. And the sooner we do it, the faster we do it, the better it is. Uh, and then there is a fear of steroid eye drops and contact lenses in uh, some uh, practitioners, which I think is a mistake. We need to do whatever it takes to control the process and make uh, patients um, uh, comfortable. So what are the kind of treatments we use? Uh, Preservative-free artificial tears. Uh, now, whatever I'm going to tell you, 
a lot of it is uh, a lot of these treatments uh, they may be used for something else they may be antibiotics but they have immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive actions and that's what we want anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory actions and sometimes uh, sometimes you have antibiotics but when they are used in non-antibiotic dose they have anti-inflammatory immunomodulating uh, actions which is what we want so I'm going to be telling you uh, some of the treatments over here and you say well wow, this is an antibiotic why do I need an antibiotic do I have an infection no it's not the infection it is anti-inflammatory immunomodulating effect of anti antibiotics that we want to use. So we use erythromycin eye ointment, for example, at bedtime. And the reason why we do that is because it raises the immune threshold at, threshold at which uh, the immune reactions take place. So it's an immunomodulating agent, and we want that. And so very good uh, way, uh, very good therapy. We use doxycycline, 50 milligrams once a day, and again, the reason is that at this dose, it, it has good anti-inflammatory actions on the surface of the eye, good for meibomian glands, the oil-producing glands. And uh, there is enough literature out there to suggest that this helps. Uh, we use compounded medications. Initially, we start with steroids, which are preservative-free. They are compounded in our pharmacy. Again, preservative-free, because we start with uh, doses four times a day for a, uh, for a week, then we tailor taper it down to three times a day, then twice a day for a week, then once a day. Once I'm at the once a day level, we can switch it to a commercial steroid which has preservatives because once a day, well, we're not using too much preservative, that's fine. So we start off with uh, compounded steroids to take care of inflammation. Serum tears is a very good strategy. Serum tears is made from uh, patient's own blood. It's safe to use. Uh, we use it in 50% dilution and uh, four times a day. The way we ask the patients to use it is to lay down and then use uh, uh, the drop, let it linger on the eye for some time, lift the upper lid a little bit so that part of it goes back and that area that under the upper lid, which, is, uh, which I showed you, which can be uh, quite diseased. Uh, we use them about four times a day, but you can't overdose on it. A patient can use it more often than that. There is, it's a blood component therapy, so uh, there is a beyond use date that one needs to be careful about. Uh, when the bottles are thawed, they can be used only for seven days, uh, frozen for about 30 days or so. We, we have those instructions that uh, we give them, but it's a good therapy. We can use uh, the same blood that comes, uh, which we are doing now. Um, we can process it to make it PRGF, platelet-rich growth factor, and uh, that uh, has even uh, more growth factors in it than just serum. And sometimes we can use uh, that, uh, that processed blood. So there are many things we do with blood. Platelet-rich plasma is another one we can do. Then there are some other compounded eye drops that have come out of our own work, which we'll talk uh, briefly, um, which are sub and dose of heparin eye drops, DNA eye drops, or um, IVIG are used as eye drops. Again, all of these designed to take care of inflammation on the surface of the eye. In combination, start it first so that we can control the condition and then we move away from some of them as, uh, as the response comes. So uh, these are serum tears a little bit uh, that I uh, spoke to you about, 50% dilution uh, and, uh, and how you use them. Next, I'll talk a little bit about contact lenses. Contact lenses is also a very good way of making uh, patients comfortable. Um, it's a piece of plastic on the eye, really, I and mean, that's what a contact lens is, whether it's a soft lens or a uh, large prose lens, but in the, in the end, it's a piece of plastic. And what it does is it puts the eye surface behind this covering, and whatever, is going, whatever mess is going on in the tear fluid it's now not going to come in contact with the surface of the eye. So if there are uh, enzymes or, uh, uh, or uh, molecules that are uh, proteases or molecules that are causing problem to the surface of the eye, well, let it cause problem to the surface of the plastic lens because now the eye is under the plastic. That's one way in which it can work. The other is that 
now the lid is not moving over a surface which is diseased, right? So the, uh, so now the patient is going to be more comfortable because the eyelid is moving over the contact lens. The contact lens is protecting the surface which uh, had all this uh, epithelial problems and was stimulating the nerves to cause pain. And so the pain and the discomfort also reduces substantially. Contact lens is a very good strategy. We have used both soft contact lenses. The uh, type of lenses we use are silicon hydrogel contact lenses uh, as opposed to uh, the other uh, soft contact lenses. And uh, we use uh, the larger scleral lenses also, which are the pros lenses for which, which is more of an art to fit. Um, and, and there are other scleral lenses also that can be used. But this is a very good strategy. And this is what uh, this um, uh, uh, picture, photograph, shows you uh, a contact lens on the surface of the eyes. Look at the edge of the contact lens. You can tell very well that the contact lens is placed in the first picture. In the second picture, where you see uh, lissome in green staining, see where the contact lens was covering? There is so, the blue dots are so few. But outside that area, they become very dense. Why? Because the contact lens is protecting that surface, and that's what we want. In the uh, picture that is uh, at the bottom, you see that rim, that white rim. Why is that white rim over there? Because we had a soft contact lens on the eye, and that's the area where the contact lens was uh, placed, that edge of the contact lens, and that area is, does not have those blue dots. Outside that area, a lot of blue dots, right? So. And then you say, well, why don't we go bigger then? Of course, that's why we go for the pros lens, which is bigger. Can we go bigger? I don't know, maybe we can, but we don't uh, probably have those contact lenses. But that's the idea, that we cover the surface of the eye, prevent it from uh, all the mess that is inflammatory mess that is going on the, in the tear fluid, protect the surface from the lids, and uh, make the patients more comfortable and the disease less. Contact lens is a very good strategy. Are there any new treatments? Well, we have uh, done a lot of work on what goes on on the surface of the eye and in the tear fluid, and we found that there are a lot of inflammatory material that is produced from cells which are called neutrophils, and we published a lot on these. Uh, but the bottom line is that, uh, that these uh, neutrophils that produce uh, this inflammatory mess uh, which we call neutrophil extracellular traps, they can stimulate, uh, they can not just directly cause uh, cytotoxicity or, uh, or pathology on the surface of the eye, but also can stimulate autoimmune uh, reactions um, that can further add to the injury. And we have this diagram which shows, uh, and after the present presentation, I can talk and explain this more. This will take probably four hours, not 40 minutes. Uh, so we'll just move on. Uh, but the reason why I'm showing this diagram is that there are many new therapies that, are, uh, that we are developing that can um, help uh, counteract the uh, bad effects of uh, these molecules at various uh, places. One of them uh, is uh, brimonidin nanoemulsion that came from our lab but is now being um, uh, taken to phase three clinical trials, uh, and I think uh, Oxygen has a, uh, has a stall outside where they talk about their clinical trial. It's an ongoing clinical trial. Uh, they are still recruiting, and uh, this is uh, something that we believe uh, it can help patients with ocular GVHD. There are other clinical trials that are going on, again, that came uh, from our lab. One of them is to use DNA eye drops which uh, cuts the backbone of these inflammatory uh, uh, strands, and that's, uh, that we are very excited about. Intravenous immunoglobulins used as eye drops is another one that uh, we are using now, um, which works uh, very well. We've done one, um, one phase one clinical trial on it, and actually just the paper was published uh, two days ago and um, so people are now talking about it. Um, so there are many new therapies that we are developing. Uh, DNAs, heparin, brimonidin nanoemulsion, IBIG eye drops. Cambium is another uh, company which is developing a 
platelet cell lysate, uh, which is also in clinical trials. So there's a lot going on in the field, but for these kind of therapies, one either has to be in clinical trials or have to use them off-label. Um, whichever way, you have to go to a center that is uh, really doing these treatments. But, there's a, but my point uh, in bringing this up is that there is, there is a lot that is going on, and we are figuring things out on why uh, ocular GVHD happens at a molecular level, at a cellular level, and there are new treatments in the works. You can get them even now in, uh, as part of clinical trials or as, uh, as in centers which are giving them. Uh, this is, these are da just data about Brimonity nanoemulsion, which uh, folks from Oxygen outside can talk to you about. Uh, this is this slide shows uh, this is this paper is published now. I took this uh, collage from the paper. This shows how uh, when we use IVIG as eye drops, it reduces uh, surface disease as compared to eye drops that don't have IVIG, uh, which is basically what is IVIG? These are basically antibodies that are pooled from thousands of uh, sub uh, do volunteers donors. And these antibodies are concentrated, and then we use these antibodies to treat the surface. And it's pretty uh, uh, anti, they have great anti inflammatory, immunosuppressive, immunomodulatory effects. And that, that, this is something that we are very excited about. Will I go blind from this uh, disease? And I'll stop now in a few minutes. The answer is no, but it can affect the quality of life. Uh, this is a statement that one of our patients from Seattle told me on the phone, it was relayed by, a, uh, by the physician who was referring the patient, that the patient is, uh, the person who was suffering from ocular GVHD described the symptoms as eyes have been dipped in hot sauce and rolled in sand. And that probably is the way to describe this. This could be very painful. Uh, the vision can go down because of the surface disease. There could be secondary problems like herpes simplex uh, infection on the cornea that can cause problems, so which could be uh, vision threatening. There could be bacterial infections that can, that can happen that can be vision threatening. But in general, it does not, uh, it's a quality of life issue. Yes, there can be some vision threatening problems, but treat it fine, well, if you're having a regular follow-ups, it's not, it's not going to rob you of the vision. Um, these slides show how we work and uh, the ocular GVHD meeting. Uh, and I think we'll take question and answers from here on. Okay. We'd like to thank Dr. Jane for his presentation. And now we'll open the floor up for questions. How much blethroitis is caused by demodex or dry eye, it's nasty. How much do you see demo, demicosis in stem cell patients? Did I get that right? Yeah, so, okay. um, dem so the question is that in the eye, eyelid margin, there are eyelashes, and at the base of eyelashes, they are commensals. Commensals means things that stay with the human body, like bacteria. We are more bacterial cells, by the way, than human cells. I hope you know that. Uh, we are covered with bacteria. And so these are uh, organisms that reside in the base of eyelashes called demodex. The issue is, uh, are these the reason for uh, ocular GVHD, or they uh, contribute to ocular GVHD, or uh, blepharitis, or symptoms that the patients are having. It's a controversial uh, question. It's a controversy in general also how much demodex causes problems. Uh, but my view is that in ocular GVHD, uh, demodex would probably cause the same problems as they would in patients who do not have ocular GVHD, meaning they may be a little bit of a nuisance or they're causing some blepharitis. But that's not the reason why a person has ocular GVHD. Ocular GVHD is an immunological attack after the bone marrow transplant on the surface of the eye. That's what it is. So uh, how much would Demodex uh, contribute? Uh, one can pull the lashes, see if they are there, then one can treat them. But uh, they, 
could be contributing a little bit more to the symptoms, but they are not the reason for ocular GVHD. Here's a question over here. Hi. Um, I am very concerned about the expense. I now am using myself the serum, and it really does help, but I can't afford to keep on using it. Is there any help in that area? Yeah, well, Serum Clears uh, is compounded. And any compounded medication, unfortunately, is not covered by insurance because it's off-label use. Um, I wish people were doing uh, clinical studies and trials and getting them to be FDA approved, and, but that's just a wish. Uh, the costs differ. Uh, at our institute, uh, the only cost that is placed on the, uh, on the patients is the cost of making them. And that's, at UIC, they charge $85 for a 30-day supply. Then you may wonder, why 30-day supply? One, why one week? Why don't we say you can use it for three months or you can use it? Uh, all the most patients end up doing that. But the reason is that there are regulations, and there is something called beyond use date, which is, uh, which is mandated by uh, the federal government, and that's what the pharmacies tell you, that once uh, you freeze them, you can use them for 30 days, What once you thaw them, you can use for seven days. The answer to your second part of your question is their health. Well, in many small ways at UIC, we try to help people with a small fund that we have called the GVHD fund, which we uh, established about two years ago. And patients who have really, really nasty surface problem and they really can't do uh, anything about it, we cover their uh, costs, at least for the initial treatments. And obviously we can't, we don't have very deep pockets to cover them for the whole year or so. We would like to if there are more donations that come into that fund. But, uh, but we try to help as much as we can. But I do understand this is a very important issue. How do you cover these costs? And this is just serum tears. There could be other, um, uh, other uh, off-label treatments also that we give. So it all adds up. Last year, I was able to go to MAP, and they helped me pay for my drops. They're right down the street from UIC. You just have to fill out a form, and they'll approve it. It's a medical assistance program, and they were well, really helpful. That's good to know for me also. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's called the medical assistance. And also, uh, I was told from the VA, uh, you get them uh, much uh, cheaper. There's some, someone over here also is from VA. Oh, yeah, it's a medical assistance. Right, we have a question back here. Oh, two questions. Who sponsors MAP? It's UIC. It's UIC? OK, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, my question for Dr. Jane is, if you've had ocular GVHD for a while, <clears throat> um, to what extent were any, would any of the new treatments uh, be helpful? Uh, can, can you repeat the question? <clears throat> yes, if you've had ocular GVHD for like five years, yes. to what extent might any of the new treatments be helpful for a patient that scores zero on the Schirmer test and uh, like is currently in one of the uh, hard... So the, Contact question, lenses. so the question is that, and um, it's a good question, is the question is that if you have ocular GVHD and now you're five years out, would the new treatments help or what, how do we think about this? Um, so ocular GVHD, when it develops, I have been saying this over and over again, that this is a immunological attack from, uh, that goes on the surface of the eye. That happens uh, within the first two years or so. After that, it tends to burn out. So if you divide the disease in two phases, the first phase is causing the damage. And if it causes uh, the lacrimal glands to shut out, the surface to become messy, but that is an immunological attack and we do all these kind of treatments to take care of it. After it has died down, it, it has left in its wake the damage. That hasn't gone away. So although there is no new immunological attack on the surface of the eye, but the eye now at five years has lost the ability to produce tears, and if the meibomian glands are not there, is not producing oil, so it has become a severe tear-deficient dry eye, which 
in of itself starts uh, getting into a vicious cycle of inflammation even without ocular GVHD bases being active. So would these treatments, the newer treatments that we are saying, would they help? The answer is yes, they would, because the inflammatory cycle now is being sustained by different mechanisms, but still it's an inflammatory cycle. Perhaps not the ocular GVHD inflammation, but dry eye inflammation. Does that make sense? So we are talking about two, we transition from ocular GVHD being the driver of uh, all the problems to dry eye, tear deficient dry eye being the driver of problems. My wife has been being treated for GVH in the eye for a couple of years, actually with quite a bit of success, but she has an unequal pupil size periodically. Sometimes the left is visibly larger, sometimes the right. They've done CAT scans and MRIs and Dopplers, and they say we have no idea what's going on. Is that from the GVHD? Unlikely. My experience has been that a GVHD, uh, for most part, if not all, is a ocular surface disease. It does not uh, affect the internal uh, or structures of the eye. So uh, the pupil could be related to, and I'm sure they went through the entire neurological examination to look at the various reasons for the pupils to be unequal, um, but that seems to be a unrelated uh, issue. Um, very rarely would uh, ocular GVHD cause any problems inside the eye. Hello. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Jane for helping my wife get a better quality of life. And uh, Dr. Nathan, is it? Yes. Question. Yes. I think you may have just answered, but my question was, um, my wife had ocular GV GVHD. Can it come back? And the second question is, how do cataracts correspond or affect or come into play with ocular GVHD? Um, so as Dr. Jane already touched upon that, um, the ocular GVHD has a lifespan of, of the two years. It's on the surface, it's taken care of, but whatever um, long-standing side effects come because of the, the extent to which the ocular GVHD affected the eye, that then later on starts causing trouble. Um, as far as developing cataracts go, it's not a direct effect of, cataract, uh, of the ocular GVHD per se, but it's the treatment that you get for it. And most commonly, whenever somebody does develop ocular GVHD, since very rarely it occurs on its own, you may have other sites that may be involved, we do start patients on systemic steroids. And those systemic steroids, meaning prednisone that you may have heard about, which everybody dreads. And, um, but in the initial phase, the combination treatment helps um, control the inflammation and helps to, you know, helps simultaneously with the topical treatment. But it is those steroids, when you've used it for an extended period of time, that can uh, affect, uh, can affect the lens and, and lead to the cataracts. And um, so that's what we see, uh, cataracts because of uh, just the fact that patients were on steroids. Uh, cataract surgery in ocular GVHD is also pretty successful. It's not a problem. The results that we have seen are comparable to what we see in general uh, patients who have cataracts. There are some issues, for sure. The issues are that the recovery time may be longer. There could be more discomfort uh, in the recovery phase. The surface epithelium may slough off. We have to put a contact lens. We like to put a suture in the wound so that if we go to a contact lens uh, earlier, we don't distort the wound. Uh, and uh, so there are some differences. There is some uh, eye drops that we don't like to use after cataract surgery in ocular GVHD patients. These are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops, uh, ketorolac or ecular, because they can cause uh, corneal melts and problems. So you, the, if done, fine. If we know what we are uh, going for, uh, that the overall picture, if we know that this is ocular GVHD and we have to do, a, do certain things a little bit differently than normal cataract patients, uh, then the outcomes are same, no difference. They are very happy. 
Hi, a um, couple questions. Just quickly, <clears throat> with regards to folks with advanced GVHD who have lost their mybomian and lacrimal glands, would, is doxycycline still worthwhile PO to try? Or again, is it too far advanced? Well, if doxycycline, I mean, obviously, uh, it's uh, best if there is something to save. If there's nothing left to save, it's, uh, it's, um, then there's nothing out there. But doxycycline still has good uh, anti-inflammatory effects on the surface of the eye. I would still go with it. But uh, on the subject of mebomian glands, I, we like to blame ocular GVHD for it. And our experience now, our position is changing on that, that uh, a lot of, in a lot of patients, these glands are already lost before they get the bone marrow transplant because of the chemotherapies they were on. So you did enter bone marrow transplant with not even having those glands in the first place. Chemotherapies are the one to blame for that. And we, we are seeing that in a lot of our patients. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of progression in mebomian gland uh, dropouts with patients who have even full-blown ocular GVHD. So I don't know how much ocular GVHD is really killing those glands. Or maybe we are protecting them with what the things we are doing and we are not seeing what would ordinarily happen if we were not giving those treatments. So kind of hard to tell. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Are you familiar with something called lipoflow? Um, it's a technique that I've recently learned about. And again, I'm wondering if it's any good in people without you know, tear, duct, tear glands and, and my bone main glands and an advanced state. So I'm fond of uh, calling Lippy Flow as the spa version of warm compresses. And uh, you know, we can have good music and some play and it's just an $800 treatment. I don't think there is any harm in it, but I think if you are doing warm compresses and uh, lid scrubs, uh, but warm compresses mainly every day, the idea is the same, that you want to increase with heat, you want to raise the temperature, and with a little pressure on the surface of the eye, you want to drive the oils out. And while you're doing that, if you do that every day, you may not need the same pressure as uh, with lippy flow. But if you have the $800 and you don't mind spending them, I would say go for it. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Chen, for your presentation. Um, I'm 18 months post-transplant. Um, my oncologist, when I come in, he looks in my eyes. He said, did they hurt? Are they scratchy? Do they itch? No, no, no. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while I look in the mirror and I see redness, you know, on the side. And my wife gets concerned about it. But I'm not having any, you know, ocular pain or, or discomfort. Um, so my question is, would a regular ophthalmologist be able to treat me for this condition? Because I don't know that, you know, my oncologist would know a ophthalmologist who specializes in this. So that, that's the question. How, uh, how, how comfortable could I be going to a regular ophthalmologist with a condition like this, should it occur? So um, we, uh, when we treat ocular surface diseases in general, uh, there is a, a very well-known disconnect between, uh, in a lot of patients, between what they perceive as discomfort because of their eye disease and the extent of eye disease. The two are not, uh, they don't, uh, they're not as congruent as we feel. If it were, they were, it would be easy, but they're not. So you could have a situation where there, you have a lot of eye disease on the surface, but you're happy and you're not complaining at all. And they're on to the other side of the spectrum, our patients, we look at the eye and say, there's nothing I can find, but they are very, very symptomatic. So pain and symptoms are not a true indicator of what's going on on the surface. That's number one, very important to uh, understand. And that's why I began this presentation by saying that if there is anything that goes on with the eye, any light sensitivity, any mucus discharge, any redness, you need to seek uh, you need to seek an examination from someone who knows about it right away. Now, with that examination itself, now what would the person who's examining do? If they're just going to look at your eye and say the same thing, your eyes look red, use artificial tears, that's not helpful. So one has to know whether there is inflammation going on. Are there tests that can be done? The answer is yes. Uh, there is an inflammatory test, MMP9 test, which we use very often. And 
it can show a pink line like a pregnancy test that shows uh, pink lines and tell you that you have an ongoing active inflammation on the surface of the eye. Uh, I think um, it is important that uh, you tell your oncologist that you would want to go to ophthalmologists at places which, uh, uh, which deal with this uh, condition. And I think it is very important to educate them also because I would, and we are trying to do so ourselves, in that this is not just another dry eye situation. And that's the message that if there's one message that I want to give everybody here and you want to transmit to your oncologist is that this is not just another dry eye. Please don't think of it that way. This is more serious than that. This requires examination tailored to that and treatments that are different and that are more aggressive perhaps than what you would do in, um, in just another dry eye. Ristasis and Zydra, they are prescription medications. They are given, but they may not and do not work in this uh, situation. So let's not just have false comfort. Yes, and I would like to second that. Um, in all of our patients, we work very closely with Dr. Jay and, and his group. And we are actually now trying to even send patients before they go to transplant, get their eyes evaluated, and then we have them follow routinely whether you have symptoms or not. It is good to know that you're okay. Um, I mean, we, we go to the extent of even having a referral, like just follow-up visit, even if he doesn't ask for it, we do send them if somebody is coming off of their immunosuppression, because that's the time you may see that inflammation can act up and can run you into trouble. So we really don't take it very lightly. And, and, and as, as Dr. Jane also mentioned, it needs to be a combined treatment that needs to be done. And you know, we've looked at this, and there was a, a consensus group um, between the two transplant groups, Europe and, and in the US, and uh, I was a part of that. And the, the, the main thing we take off whenever you think about ocular symptoms is work with an ophthalmologist who knows what they're doing. Very, very important. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm here with my daughter, Nikki, who is five years transplant. Um, she has a light sensitivity. Still has it to this day. We've tried the lenses, the eyeglasses. I mean, is there anything? So light sensitivity, uh, one obviously has to uh, see what could be the reason for light sensitivity. Is the reason for light sensitivity the f is that the surface has a lot of dry cells on it so that when the light hits, it irritates uh, uh, the nerves. And if that's the reason, one has to take care of that. Or if the reason that uh, there is maybe a cataract uh, that has developed, which so when the light enters the eye, it uh, diffracts. And instead of uh, forming a clean image on the retina, it's now dazzling the retina. So there are, uh, one, there are reasons for light sensitivity to be there. And one has to work to exclude each one of them, and once you figure out which one it is, then of course you target that reason. But I think um, light sensitivity is something that is uh, addressable, uh, because it seems that in a lot of patients we are able to figure out what could be the reason that is contributing to it. question. We're going to get somebody who has it. I think, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, Karen is, uh, I'm her caregiver, and she's 24 years out of her bone marrow transplant. And so now she has lost vision in her right eye, and there, her uh, ophthalmologist is only um, treating her for severe dry eye. She's not gone to any of the medications. Um, and we're wondering if, she's wondering if the damage is uh, permanent because she has now limited vision in her right eye. Um, we obviously need uh, a little bit more information than that, yeah. that uh, whether the loss of vision was due to uh, the surface of the eye becoming scarred or opaque, the transparent part of the eye, the cornea being scarred such that it is not allowing light to go in, is that the reason 
because of dryness and so on, or is the reason uh, to do with the retina or something else going inside the eye? What, what is the reason why the vision has uh, become the way it is? It, it, there are many reasons why the eye could lose vision. One person could have high pressure and glaucoma, which can uh, basically kill all the nerve fibers of the nerves to form vision. There could be problems in the retina that uh, can cause uh, vision to be lost. There could be uh, the front of the eye. Now, if it is the front of the eye, then those are addressable. In many, there are surgeries that can help. There is, uh, uh, again, this would be something that one needs to look at to see whether it is a front of the eye addressable, uh, surgically addressable cause, or whether it is at back of the eye a reason for the vision to be lost. Um, so that, that's why I said we probably need more information than that to address that question uh, in a more meaningful way. In the, essence, in the essence of time, we're gonna thank Dr. Jane and Dr. Nathan for their expertise and time this morning. Um, this will conclude the morning session and you are free to move on to the uh, next morning session. Thank you.